Well, good morning. My name is Tom, if you're our guest today, and I'm one of the pastors here at Oak Ridge Community Church, and I wanted to welcome everybody here this morning. Real quickly, how many of you guys are hosting Thanksgiving at your house this, this year? Raise your hand, or I can get them up. Yeah, great. How many of you guys like to cook and bake stuff for the holiday season? Any of you guys have cookies and so forth? You know, uh, the question I get asked a lot, and the one I see in culture that people aren't asking enough is, is why do you go to church? Why does church mean anything to me? And uh, it kind of reminds me of cooking. I get four things normally out of church when I always show up early. One, I get freedom. And if you're new to Christianity, so it, it seems like church is about rules. It's not about rules. It's, I've got the right, and I can do anything I choose to do. But God says that not all things are beneficial. So I have freedom to choose better choices. That's one thing. Second thing is I hear truth. At times, it's hard to find truth in this world, and I deceive myself a lot. Any of you guys deceive yourself? You can talk yourself into anything. You're on a diet, and you said, but I haven't ate that for like a week. I can eat that. now. I deserve that. I get a pat on the back. So one, I get truth that I have to wrestle with and have to say, okay, is that right? And then the third thing I get out of church, there's four. The third thing is I get grace. God loves me. No matter what I've done, God loves me, and he will love me, and he loves you the same way. And then the fourth thing that I get is I learn how to love more. I've been married to my wife, Kathy, for 40 years. And uh, she's still probably one of the toughest people for me to love well consistently. And I'd say she'd say the same thing for me. I mean, I love her, but at times I get a bit selfish. At times I'll get envious. At times I'll have a short temper. At times I'll keep record of wrongs. Then I'm able to go back to God and God says, Tom, that's not the way to be. That's not how you live the abundant life. So when I add those three things, freedom, truth, grace, and love, it makes for a better life. And that's what I tell all of you to come to. That's what I want for my children, and I want for my children's children. And because of the church, when it's working right, when it's preaching who Jesus is and preaching the truth and the love of Jesus, the relationship, it makes a difference in lives. And the sooner you can get that in your mind and heart, the better a life you'll have. For that said, let's go to God in prayer. God, first we acknowledge you and we thank you for all you've done. And we thank you that uh, you care for us. God, it's amazing your grace. It's amazing your strength. It's amazing your wisdom. And God, I thank you that uh, you've loved us enough to offer almost all those things to us, God, fully. I pray for the person that's in here today that's just in the valley low, that just is, something just doesn't quite feel right at church, I mean, in their life, that their faith just hasn't meant much to them, and maybe this is the day that you've brought them here, God, just to say, okay, let's get that one in gear and let's change this. Father, I pray for the person that's returning to church again, that got burnt by church or something a Christian said or did, that they can refocus on you, Jesus, and you alone. God, I pray for all the people that are heavy-hearted with loss during this holiday season, that you lift them up a bit, that you touch their hearts deeply, that they know that they're cared for, and at the end of the day, uh, it'll be okay. You've got it. God, we thank you for all you've done for us. We thank you for this place called Oak Ridge. We thank you for our locations. We thank you for all the people that serve here. We thank you for the body uh, that attends here. God, guide us and direct us. May this service today be our gift to you and uh, to one another. And Father, may we lift your son's name high. It's in his name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Kelsey, why don't you come up? We've got a couple of announcements. Morning. I'm Kelsey. Um, hey, like Tom said, we have a few announcements before we get started. First off, if you are a visitor, you've never been to this location or Arnold, there's a few things we want to point out. Um, first off, we want to meet you. We have an information de um, desk right outside those doors. We can answer any questions, give you a tour, and make sure you and everyone who's with you today gets a free t-shirt. Is it so tour or tour? What did I say? I, I could, it's whatever I said. Okay, then that's right. <laughs> Also, you'll notice there's no offering in service. Um, that's by design. We ask that you not give and let this service be our gift to you. But if you call Oak Ridge your home, there's joy boxes throughout the campus and there's giving online. And then also there's no communion in service, but there's a room called the reflection room right down that hallway. Um, we have a prayer team in there, a prayer wall if you want, some prayer, and then also communion set up. So that will be open all morning if you want to stop by. What else? Also, tonight we're having our edge up here at Oak Ridge City. We will have one more edge in a few weeks as kind of a Christmas celebration, but this is kind of our semester wrap up. Um, we're gonna have a really fun after party afterwards, hit the gym, play some basketball, have games and stuff. So 
If you have any students in your life, um, middle school through high school, even if they've never been, make sure they get up here. It's going to be a really fun night. Um, also, we have baptism signups going on right now. There is an announcement in your bulletin if you want more information. Um, but we simply believe if you believe in Jesus, that's your next step if you haven't already been baptized. So any questions or anything like that, you can find someone in the Connect room downstairs. And hey, they Kelsey, can... did you know there's a few people that have signed up for baptism here? And we're in the process right now of purchasing the baptistry that will be delivered here, hopefully, within the next two weeks. I did it. And we're going to have our first baptism service here. I believe it's, if it's not the first, it's the eighth or the one after that. So that's going to be a fun that's one awesome. to be at. That's awesome. Um, this week and next, we have a food drive going on. So if you brought in cans this week, make sure you drop them off by that Christmas tree. If not, there's still time. Bring them in next week. Um, and then what else? We have the volunteer night coming up in a few weeks on December 6th. Volunteer night's December 6th. For all you guys that have served uh, about 12 times during the course of the year, you can sign up online. <clears throat> and when you register online, when you show up, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> I've already died. <laughs> When, when uh, you register online, when you show up, we'll give you your $80 that night. And just nobody else knows this at Oak Ridge Arnold, so we're not going to tell them because I don't want them to give a head start. This is the first year we've introduced Nikes to the thing. So um, if you weren't thinking about going before, maybe you might want to show up now. There's some of that. But it's a great night. If you've never been there, there's food everywhere. We turn the whole place into basically a Macy's. And we say thanks to all of our volunteers. And we'd love for you to be there, to see everybody together, all people in one place. It's both uh, campuses are having that same night. So it is a great night of food. And like I said, sign up online. You can register online. And when you show up, they'll give you your $80, your $80 Oak Ridge Bucks to buy and shop. And it's going to be a great night. December 6th, doors open at 6.15. Got that? What else? Um, you want to talk about the Be Rich campaign? Yeah. We have a campaign called Be Rich. And what it is is we ask everybody to give $39.99. The accountants told me this year, could you please ask them to give $40? So I'm going to ask you to round it up, all right, to $40, but it's actually $39.99. I'm going to be saying that the whole time. But, and here's what it supports. We have some great ministry partners that do some amazing things that if we support them, then uh, it helps our community. So we have two great places that provide food for literally thousands of people year round. So this Be Rich, when you bring your $40, every person, not one person, like you bring 40, I bring 40, my wife Kathy brings 40, so forth. When we all do that, we're able to raise, I think it was a little bit over 40 some odd thousand dollars last year. And when we do that, we have partners, like I said, one of them is uh, for food. Another one is for children the age two down. They provide, uh, we've got some uh, pregnancy centers that help uh, with families, Diapers, formula from ages two down, uh, two of them in the metro area that are phenomenal. We have some schools we support. This year we have a prison ministry that we're going to add to the thing. We have some foreign missionaries that we support through this. We have a school down in Haiti of over 100 kids right now who are going through some major tough times in Haiti uh, that we support. And there's other people during the course of the year. So the point of the, the matter is when you bring 40 bucks, you feed people in our area. You help children uh, with uh, that, are, that are young. You help school children. You help people that are struggling with addictions. You help people that are in our prison system. And you're, you're actually the hands and feet of Jesus on and beyond this church. So I just encourage you all to do that. And the way to remember it is it's four. We're going to bring $40 for and then TY thank you. I'm telling you in advance. Thank you. So uh, we'll tell you over the next uh, three weeks when we do it and we'll have a collection and that'll be our Christmas offering that we're bringing to God. And hopefully if we get going on above what our goal is then we'll support some other people. So you guys ready for a great day of worship? Yeah, um, a couple of them, yeah. Are you guys ready for a great day of worship? Yeah. Uh, stand up, stand up and say hello to somebody. But hold on, before you do that, here's what I want you to ask them. What's your favorite Thanksgiving Day food? And let's hit it hard Thursday, right? It's a f- 
heaven You stepped down to earth Innocent perfection You gave your life for us And we are amazed We stand in awe For we have been changed
It's really kind of the same as, as our tithes, as, as when we uh, give, as when we serve, as our, our praise is also uh, an opportunity to, to give an offering to God. And that uh, in Revelation, um, in the midst of all of this imagery, it, it's talking about uh, the prayers and praises of the saints rising up as incense to God. And, and he actually enjoys it. Um, but I think ultimately we get more out of it than God does. Um, but it, but it has to end up being all about him and lifting up his name. And so this song that we're about to sing uh, has, has a very simple chorus and, and, and really it just focuses on this word hallelujah, uh, which comes from the Greek or the Hebrew and, it, and it's uh, praise the Lord. Um, and so I would encourage you to take this opportunity to really give it your all, give it your all during this offering time of praise. Uh, if you're not there yet, that is fine. Uh, take this opportunity uh, to just survey your heart and think over the lyrics. But uh, if it is really true that God really delights in our praise, uh, let's, give, let's give him our best.
All right, well, welcome back to part three of Fascinating. I am excited to be in the room. Make some noise if it's good to be in the room today. Uh, we're here, we made it, um, and I am excited that it is not only us who are joining in together in this moment, but we have another campus where God's doing some extraordinary things. So can we welcome in Oak Ridge City? Um, excited to have you 
with us and, uh, and also a bunch of people watching online. We're going to dive right in because we got a lot of ground <laughs> to, to cover. Um, raise your hand if you would say like there's that one place in your life. Um, maybe it's a restaurant, a vacation spot, maybe even something you've seen on the internet where you're like, you know, I want to go there. Or when I have gone there, it's like the closest thing to heaven on earth. You have a spot like that where it's like, man, I just love it so much. For me, big stuff comes to mind. Um, if a lot of you guys have gone to big, a lot of us have gone to big stuff for a lot of times. It's our camp with students. And there's just something about it when you pull up to this ratchet hotel, which is just really gross. Uh, nobody uses that word anymore, but it is fitting for the hotel that we stay at, at big stuff camps. But there's just something sacred about it. I have so, there's been so many like spiritual breakthroughs in my life. A lot of my best friends came to know Jesus there. I worked there for three summers and kind of got launched into ministry. I love it. So many good memories. And one of my favorite memories is when I was an intern. And one of our main roles as interns was security. And, uh, and, and, and security was just, we needed to get their kids in the room at curfew, which was 1130. Okay. And some of you guys have heard this story. Most of you have not. Um, but, but we had started hearing kind of rumors of like each week where there's like 1500 kids down there, there would be a few bad apples every week that would sneak out generally on the last night of camp, maybe in the middle of the night and go on to the beach and like smoke weed or something, you know, pass the ganja around. Okay. Um, do some doobies. Can you tell I've never done that before? Okay. Um, and, and, and so they would do that or a guy and a girl would sneak out and we'd just like hear it. And so what I wanted to happen, okay. Like my fantasy was that on security, I wanted to catch someone trying to sneak out. Okay. And then yell at them and then have them take off running the other way and then have like a high speed chase, like an episode of cops that ends with me tackling them on the beach. Like it was literally a fantasy. And so there's one night, it was like middle of the night, 3.30 in the morning, and we're on the gator, you know, like a golf cart. Um, I remember it was like halfway through the summer. And I said, why do we call this golf cart a gator? And they said, because it's a gator, it's not a golf cart. That's why, Josh. They all started making fun of me. They were, they were, they were, they were laughing. They're like, are you serious? I'm like, don't make fun of me. Don't blame me. I was homeschooled. My parents homeschooled me. That wasn't my decision, right? Uh, any homeschoolers in the room? Anybody? Okay, we got to stick together. Uh, we got to stick together. We're behind a little bit socially. Um, I'm just kidding. I'm not making fun of you. I'm really not. I loved homeschool. It was the goodest experience of my life. Um, I told myself I'm going to stop telling that joke like 30 times, but it just never gets old. Um, and, and so I'm on this gator, and I see these two kids, literally. They, they're, they're on the boardwalk. It's like 3.30 in the morning, and I say, hey, and they take off running. True story. Take off running. I'm like, this is my chance. I take off running after him on the beach. We run like three quarters of a mile in the sand. Last time I told the story, it was half a mile, but three quarters of a mile sounds better. And we're sprinting on the beach. I'm like, stop, stop, stop. Literally, after a long chase on this beach, they turn around and they say, what are you doing? I said, what am I doing? What are you doing? I'm a big stuff intern. You need to get back in your room. They both looked at me horrified and they said, what's big stuff? <laughs> oh, oh my goodness. Could you imagine the horror that these kids had being chased by this strange man? I'm like, you don't know what big stuff is? Why'd you take off running? They're like, because there were these strange guys on a golf cart yelling at us at 3.30 in the morning. I'm like, first off, it's a gator. Second off, <laughs> second off, that's a good point. Uh, that's a really good point. Do you want to know Jesus? It's a Christian camp, right? <laughs> um, and, and honestly, like big stuff comes to mind. Uh, honeymoon comes to mind. Honeymoon comes to mind. Uh, it's an all-inclusive resort in Mexico. Uh, beautiful beach, really clear ocean water, great food, king-size candy bars, king-size candy bars. Um, <laughs> I'm uh, gonna stop there before I get in trouble with my wife and my in-laws, although I'm never quite as nervous when they're on the other side of a screen. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, honeymoon comes to mind. But those aren't like the closest things to heaven on earth. For my wife, it would be honeymoon, but like Augusta National comes to mind, right? This is where the Masters takes place, okay? Beautiful golf course. I've had the privilege to go a couple times with my cousin Matt, and it's amazing. Like $2 pulled pork sandwiches, best golfers in the world. Every time you go to the bathroom, people come in behind you and wipe the toilet seat off. I mean, this is like the closest, th this is really close, but it's not the closest thing because I don't get to play the course. I just kind of have to watch other people play it. And so last month I was introduced to the place where heaven meets earth. It is Isleworth Country Club. We can throw up a couple pictures uh, if you want. Uh, this place is absolutely extraordinary. I think we have one more picture. Um, it, is, it is absolutely amazing. And my cousin Matt allowed me to go down there. It was kind of a free deal. It was so much fun. Um, he's the one who always 
introduces me to these places and everything about it was just like heavenly, okay? The grass, the white sand beaches, um, the, the, the food, my scorecard, all of it was heavenly. Um, it, was, it, was, it was amazing. And I know what some of you are thinking, you're like, really, Josh, that's the place where you think that's like where heaven meets earth? It's a golf course. You need to, you need to, you need to grow up. You need to be more spiritual. You're a pastor. Well, you need to read your New Testament because Jesus is everywhere. Jesus can be on a, on a golf course. Um, <laughs> Uh, I'm, I'm joking. I actually don't know how, how I would answer that question. If you looked at me and said, what's the place? I don't know. Depending on the day, it probably changes like all the time because I, you know, I'm just, my mind's all over the place. I don't really know. But if you were to ask someone in the time of Jesus, if you were to ask someone in the time of Jesus, what is the place where heaven meets earth? Actually, the time of Jesus and about thousand years prior to the time of Jesus, no hesitation, the temple. The temple is the place where heaven meets earth earth. Absolutely. This is the place where God resides among his people. This is where God's activity is most clearly seen. It is in the temple. And what's interesting is that all throughout the the, the ministry of Jesus, he, he kind of just says like, this whole thing points to me. We can wait for that slide. This whole thing points to me. The, the, the temple points to me. In fact, there's one point in John chapter two. In John chapter two, he's He's, uh, he's, he's in the temple courts. It's the court of the Gentiles. And so this is the place where the Gentiles and the women are, are allowed to come and pray and meet with God. And, and he gets angry. He gets angry. He starts flipping over tables. And he starts like saying, you've made my father's house, which is a house of prayer, into a den of robbers. And there, there's debate on why he was so mad. I think it makes sense that Jesus' mission is to connect people with the father, and, and his mission isn't just to connect Jewish men with the Father, it is to connect, it is to connect the whole world with the Father. And so, so, so you have women and you have, you have Gentiles who right now, because of what's going on in the court of the Gentiles, it is really hard for them to connect with God. And so he's angry and he's like, you know, kind of judging this whole system. And they're like, who do you think you are? Who do you think you are to come in here and, and turn over tables and make the claims that you're making? And Jesus is like, well, destroy this temple. John 2, 19, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. Destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. A couple verses later, it says that he was speaking of his body. He's like, there's a new temple in town. There's a new place where heaven meets earth. There's a new avenue where God's activity is going to be seen in the world. If you want to meet with God, you don't need to come to a temple. You need to come to me. It points to me, all of it, the sacrifices, me, forgiveness of sins, me, the high priest, me, the lamb, the scapegoat, all of it points to me. This is fascinating. This is extraordinary. Even the structure of the temple points us to who Jesus is. But how many of you guys know that that for about 400 years before the temple was constructed, before Solomon's temple was constructed, you had a tabernacle? which was kind of a temporary structure. It would be made of tents and portable different things where it could be moved around when they were wandering. And it was a place where God would meet with his people. So you have the tabernacle here and we can actually wait for that slide. I'll call for him. Uh, and and, and so, so you have, you have Jesus, you're, you, have, you have the tabernacle that's, that's kind of incorporated by God. And look at what he says in, in Exodus as he as he as he speaks to Moses, okay, Exodus 25, eight through nine. And pay attention to this, it's so important. Then have them make a sanctuary for me and I will dwell among them. Make this tabernacle and all its furnishings exactly like the pattern I tell you. Make it exactly like I tell you to make it. All the details matter, okay, and I will dwell there. Pay attention to that language. Why, Why do all the details matter? Why does God say that? These are, va- these are verses that when we're going through our Bible reading plan, we like to skip through, right? But maybe there's something here. I think the reason is it's because all of the furnishings and every detail point us to Jesus. And can we all acknowledge that if this is true, if what Moses writes about this, if the stories that he writes and the words that he shares all point to Jesus, that this is pretty fascinating. I mean, this is like 13, 14, maybe 1500 years before Christ. And every, all these different things point to who Jesus is. Well, how do you know that? How do you know that? Well, let's actually take a look 
at John chapter one, verse 45. And we talked about this week one of this series where Jesus goes to Philip and he picks him as one of his disciples. And look at what Philip does. He found his friend Nathaniel and he says, we have found the one that Moses wrote about in the law. Moses never used the word Jesus. We have found the one that Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Wait, what? So this Moses, maybe, maybe the whole book points to Jesus. How could one man, how could one man fulfill all of these different things? I think there's just one conclusion. If it's really true, the only conclusion is, is he's God. He orchestrated the story from beginning to end. And he, he, he fulf- he's the fulfillment, he's the greater tabernacle. And let me kind of explain this and then it's gonna get pretty wild, at least for me. It's been freaking me out all week, okay? And so, so let's take a look at John chapter one again, verse 14. And this is a passage that's really popular around here at Oak Ridge. And it says this, the word Jesus became flesh and made his dwelling, sound familiar? made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father full of grace and truth. Okay, this is, this is crazy cool. Okay, the English word that, that is translated here as to made his, the, the words made his dwelling or dwelt among us comes from a Greek word that is only used by, by John in his gospel. And, and this word could be better translated to live or camp in a tent. To live or camp in a tent. I think we have that on a slide. To live or camp in a tent. Again, the tabernacle. It's a portable portable tent, so to speak. Interesting. Are we picking up on this this language? In fact, it could literally be translated. John is saying, hey, the word became flesh. Jesus became flesh, and he tabernacled among us. Okay. So now we're going to look at the furnishings. And we're going to look at the different elements. We can throw that picture up yet again of the tabernacle. So here is the tabernacle. You have the outer courts, and then you have the 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 sanctuary, and then inside of that is even the holy of holies, where God is 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 resides, and where the glory of the Lord uh, is is there. All right. So we can go to the we can go to the first slide. When you would walk into the courts, you would you would see an altar of sacrifice you would see an altar of sacrifice. And there's a lot of stuff that takes place in the tabernacle, like in the sanctuary where only a few people could see it. Like, like it was God doing some stuff and, and not many people had access to that. But out here, there were a lot of people that would have seen these sacrifices. These sacrifices that would have been made on behalf of the people. Do we see maybe a type and shadow of Jesus where there's a lot of times in Jesus' ministry where he's like, don't, don't tell people about that. Don't, don't reveal myself yet, but we can make it, we can, we can obviously acknowledge that Jesus' sacrifice was very public for the world to see. And then you would go on to the bronze laver. We have the next picture, and this is essentially a water basin, and the high priest and the priest and the religious leaders would have to go and wash before they could enter in to the presence of God, okay? And there's a lot of really cool stuff here that I think points to Jesus, but for the sake of time, we're going through a lot of stuff. Let's, let's just acknowledge, okay? that this is our story. If we're a Jesus follower, we have been washed of our sins. We have been cleansed of our sins. And it is not until we are washed and cleansed of our sins to where we can actually enter into the presence of God. Do we see that Jesus might be the greater sacrifice? And do we see that Jesus might be the greater bronze laver? Are you with me? Okay, all right. Now, (laughs) this is so interesting. God says, do all of it. Do all of it the way that I tell you, (laughs) which leads us to believe even the outer coverings of the tent are intentional, okay? And so now let's throw the picture up of the outer coverings of the tent, okay? Hang with me, okay? And there might be a little bit of conjecture here, but hear me on this, okay? This isn't just like, we aren't just randomly pulling stuff, okay? This might be conjecture, but it is based on a very faithful interpretation of who Jesus is and the story of God. Okay, so keep this in mind. All right, so the first layer, this is the layer that you would have seen when you walked into the sanctuary, when you walked into the tabernacle, it was fine linen. 
fine linen, and it was beautiful, and there were magnificent colors on there, and, and it, was, it, was, it, was, it was awesome. And, and when you walked in, you were like, this is sacred ground. This is the place where heaven meets earth. And fine linen all throughout the narrative of scripture represents purity and holiness and, and righteousness. You see it with the religious leaders in the Old Testament all the way up through the book of Revelation where God says he will, he will clothe his church in fine linen. It's purity. Can we all acknowledge that Jesus on the inside is pure and holy and he's righteous and he's beautiful. And when you meet him, you see literally heaven colliding with earth. The second layer would have been goat skin, goat skin and and goats throughout the narrative of scripture. Many theologians believe, I believe it makes sense, represents sin and evil and darkness. So back in the day, it was goats. Now it's cats, right? Like, 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 it's not in the Bible, but any mature believer would say that, right? Like, like, uh, anyone have cats in the room? Okay, weirdos. Weird. No, I'm joking, I'm joking, I'm joking. You thought I was going to apologize. Um, uh, I'm kidding, back to goats. And so Jesus tells a parable of the sheep and the goats. Jesus tells a parable of the sheep and the goats, and he talks about how the sheep are innocent and, and, and righteous, and then he talks about how the goats are, they represent evil and wickedness, and they're kind of cast into hell. And then you see there's a sacrifice. There's a specific sacrifice in the Old Covenant called the scapegoat. And this is the sacrifice where the high priest would lay his hands on the goat, and it would represent, I am laying all of the sins of the people on this goat. The goat would be taken out into the wilderness, and no one would want to be near it because this represented the sins of the people. The goat skin wouldn't have been altered. It would have kind of been gross and dirty and nasty. The third layer, the third layer, think about that, okay? Evil, sin, darkness is laid upon righteousness and purity. The third layer would have been ram skin. We see very clearly that rams, they, they, they represented a sacrifice. When Abraham goes to sacrifice his son Isaac, God provides a ram in his place. He takes his place. And they hear me on this. Okay, the ram skin, while the goat skin would have been left kind of dirty and gross and as is, the ram skin, if you notice, was dyed red. And I'm not making all this up. You can see this in the text. This is the stuff we skip over. Okay, this was dyed red. Maybe, just maybe, this is a picture of a blood sacrifice that is going to be sufficient to cover the evil and the sin and the darkness of this world. Think of how extraordinary this is. Think, do you see what's unfolding before our very eyes? It points to the one who took our place on the outside. This might be my favorite element. This is wild. God's so creative and he's amazing. And, and this would have been like seal skin or badger skin. And the outer layer, it would have been kind of ugly. It wouldn't have been very attractive. In fact, when people looked at the tabernacle, they probably would have thought, really, this is the place where God resides? This is where God's activity is seen in the world? Like, it it was pretty ordinary. It was like leathery skin. It was brown. (laughs) Do you remember the verse in Isaiah chapter 53 where it says there was nothing beautiful or, or majestic that would make us desire Jesus? Like, on the outside, he looks really, really ordinary. So people are looking at this tabernacle and they're saying, really, this is the place? This is, this is the place where heaven meets earth? Sounds all like what people said about Jesus. What good could come from Nazareth? He's just an ordinary man. He's a carpenter. This is your God. Yep, on the outside, ordinary. On the inside, heaven. Whew. This is pretty fascinating, right? Then you'd walk in and you'd see a few different elements. This, this past couple months, there have been a few lights out at my house, okay? So when you walked in, the main light, right when you walked in, I have a pretty small house, uh, it, 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 it didn't work. And then my bathroom lights haven't worked and I like to shower at night, okay? In fact, I have to shower every night if I want to go to sleep. And so I've been showering in the pitch black for a couple months. Josh, why didn't you fix it? I can't, my name's Noblet, right? I can't do that, okay? All right, I can't. And then why didn't you call someone? Why didn't you call someone? Well, I just kind of got used to it. Okay, like, it's kind of nice. All right, put me to sleep. And so my wife's been very patient with me. She's so, oh man, God's good. And so, so, she, so she, texts the, she texts the guy from our church and he comes over and he looks at our bathroom light. And, and you know, we're thinking it's some real big electrical issue and he just screws in the light bulb and boom, let there be light. And, and, And I thought like the darkness was fine, but like, man, this was glorious. I had already taken a shower and I took a shower again just because I wanted to know what it felt like to take a shower with some light. It was amazing. Okay, all that to say, um, when you walked into the tabernacle, one of the first things that you would have seen, it would have been the only light in the the sanctuary would have been a lampstand. 
would have been a lampstand. We can throw the lampstand up there, okay? And again, it's the only light in this whole room. Now hear this, Jesus in his ministry, John chapter seven, he shows up at the Feast of Tabernacles. And, and, and at the Feast of Tabernacles, there would have been these massive lights that lit up the whole city of Jerusalem. And, and it's, the conjecture says it's probably just a day or two after this festival in John chapter eight. And Jesus says, I am the light of the world. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness. The lampstand, eh, pretty cool. Lights up a room, right? Like the big lights in the city of Jerusalem, neat, light up a city. I am the light of the world. Jesus is the greater lampstand. Then you would move to the table of showbread. We can throw this up there. And I'm still trying to figure out what, what this represented in the Old Testament, but on the table of showbread, there would have been bread and wine. <laughs> Jesus, night before he dies, he's, he's with his disciples. He's having a meal and he says, hey, here's some bread. He broke it, gave thanks and said, do this in remembrance of me. This is my body broken for you. And then he took the wine and he lifted the cup and he said, take this, do this in remembrance of me. This represents the new covenant of my blood. We just took the elements last week. We just, <laughs> we just took the elements that, that this was 3,500 years ago, roughly, that point to our savior, Jesus Christ, right? We took the elements, we took of the bread and wine, kind of, right? I think here at Arnold, we had those package things. I don't think that's bread. It's like a real nasty wafer. And you never know if the juice is, is expired or not. Uh, but it represents, it represents the same thing. I think we should get the real stuff, friends. I think we should get some bruschetta, right? Some Cabernet, right? Um, I'm kidding. I'm joking. There are some Baptists in the room. I'm joking. I'm joking. Uh, all the Catholics are like, dang it. Um, I'm kidding. I'm joking. <laughs> I'm joking, I'm joking. We just gotta have some fun here. We gotta have some fun. But, but, but do you see what's unfolding? Do you see what's unfolding before your very eyes? Then you'd move on to the altar of incense. Move on to the altar of incense. And this is the place where prayers would be offered up to your God and to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And the New Testament lets us know that there is one mediator between God and man, and that, that man is Jesus Christ. In other words, the only way that our prayers are offered up to God is through Jesus. Jesus is the greater altar of incense. And then it gets really wild. This is a detail in scripture where the coals, the coals from the altar of sacrifice in the outer courts would be used on the altar of incense to lift up prayers to God. So the the coals that had blood dripped on them were, were used to offer up prayers to God. Do we see this? The only reason today, if you're a believer, that God hears your prayer is through the blood sacrifice that Jesus, that Jesus partook of on the cross. And then you had a veil. You had a veil. And this represented our distance between God and man. And on one day out of the year, the high priest, the day of atonement, had to crawl under this veil and, and he would enter in and he would see this, the Ark of the Covenant. And this is heavy, not just literally, but figuratively. This was so important in the life of God's people. On the top, there's the lid, there's the mercy seat. On the bottom, there's a container that contained three different articles. The first article is the Ten Commandments. That's the, 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 the commands of God etched into stone. And and let me just acknowledge, God's people couldn't keep that. You, you've broken that. You've sinned. You've fallen short of these commands. You've fallen short of the glory of God you have. So this is actually kind of a reminder of our death sentence. We've disobeyed a holy God and we need to be punished. But there's one who could keep it. Notice Matthew chapter 5 verse 17, Jesus says, I haven't come to abolish the law and the prophets, but I have come to fulfill them. I have obeyed every last word. Jesus, Jesus is, is, is fulfilling even this. Then you would have the manna, which is bread from heaven. This is the bread that God would provide his people when they were wandering in the wilderness. And, and, and what does this have to do? What does this have to do with Jesus? Well, we just talked about how in communion, Jesus says, this is my body broken for you. But notice in John chapter six, 
He's talking about manna. He's speaking most likely to a Jewish audience and he's literally talking about manna. And then he says this, I'm the living bread, John 6:51. I'm the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Right next to the tablets of stone that represent our death is an article that Jesus says represents life and not just life, but life forever. My, my body, my bread will be given for you and you can live forever. But notice Jesus doesn't just say this is eternal life. Look at what he says in John 6, 35. I'm the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. Jesus is like, this life isn't just forever, but like in the here and now, this is a life that's a life of satisfaction. I'm enough. I fill the void. We were watching a movie last week at the edge called The Insanity of God. And there was a story among many stories where there's a pastor in the Soviet Union Communist Russia at this time where the church is being massively persecuted for simply believing in Jesus. And, and, he, and this pastor as a son and a wife gets taken off to jail. It's taken off to jail and they put him in isolation and they beat him and they brainwash him and they tell him that they're gonna kill him over and over and over again. If he doesn't renounce Jesus, he doesn't renounce Jesus. And then his family, after a long time, have the privilege to come and, 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 and meet with him in, in, the, in, the, in the yard. They're waiting at this table. They throw this man on the table and they can barely recognize him. He's so emaciated, he looks like he's about to die. The son looks at his dad, true story. Son looks at his dad, I'm so proud of you. I'm so proud of you. In fact, he was eight years old. Then his mom, which is the wife, brings a New Testament. <laughs> brings the New Testament, tries sneaking him a New Testament. She knew that's all he'd want. The guard sees it, grabs the New Testament, picks up the lady. Hey, don't you know it's because of this book and because of your God that he's in here in the first place? Don't you know I could kill him? I could kill you and I could kill your son for that matter. And I'd probably get a promotion for it. <laughs> this lady puffs out her chest. She looks him in the eye and she says, you could kill me. You can kill my husband. You can even kill my son for that matter. But nothing will separate us from the love of Jesus. How could she say that? Is she a lunatic? How could she say that? No, I don't think she is. I just think she's met the bread of life. And she knows that he is enough. The third article was Aaron's rod that budded. Aaron's rod that butted. I was looking at this stuff. I'm like, well, that's awesome. I don't know what that means, right? So I started looking at this. And okay, so backstory, Aaron is Moses' protege, okay? Like Moses is leading God's people and Aaron's like his right-hand man. And there are these men in the story that get real jealous. And, and they're like, who do these guys think they are to lead this whole thing? We want to lead, right? And so they're just typical dudes. They're like pride, you know? And, and God's like, I'm going to take care of this. And he says, everyone, just take your rod, which is dead wood that kind of represented your authority in this time period. He's like, just throw it on the ground. Just throw it on the ground. And then look at what he says in number 17, five. The staff belonging to the man I choose will sprout. Okay. This wood is dead. It's dead wood. It's detached from life. It's dead. And God says... When I, when I bring life out of death, this is going to point you to the one that I choose. Sound familiar? Why is this in the Ark of the Covenant? Like, why did God choose Aaron in the first place? We keep reading. It's just a few verses later in Numbers chapter 18, 1. The Lord said to Aaron, you and your sons and your father's house with you shall bear iniquity connected to the sanctuary. Aaron's rod that budded, okay? Life that comes out of death proves that God chooses Aaron. What, what does he choose Aaron to do? At least in part, to bear iniquity. Interesting. We believe Jesus was dead. We believe he was killed. We believe he was crucified. But like the really, really fun part of the story is that we believe he didn't stay dead. We believe that life came out of death, proving that God chose Jesus to be the sufficient sacrifice who would bear our iniquity. Do we see what is unfolding before our very eyes? Acts chapter 17, Paul's telling people to turn towards Jesus. And I'm gonna get ahead of myself, but turn towards Jesus. If you don't know Jesus, he's pretty awesome. Repent, believe, put your faith in Christ. 
And he's saying, repent, turn towards God. And then he says this, because God's fixed a day on which he'll judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed or otherwise known as chosen. And of this, he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Do you see this? Do you see how every article of a tabernacle that began 3,500 years ago or so points to our savior? This is fascinating. How could this take place? I'm gonna end this series with this. Just think about this for a moment, okay? In Genesis, he's creator God. In Exodus, he is your redeemer and Passover lamb. In Leviticus, he is your sanctification. In Numbers, he is your tabernacle. Hello, right? In Deuteronomy, he's your teacher. In Joshua, he bring, he's your mighty conqueror. In Judges, he brings victory. In Ruth, he is your kinsman, your lover, and your redeemer. In 1 Samuel, he is the greater David who slays the giant of sin. In 2 Samuel, he's the son of David who comes to lead his people. In 1 and 2 Kings, he's the king of kings and lord of lords. In 1 and 2 Chronicles, he is our intercessor and high priest. In Ezra, he is our temple and our house of worship. Do we see the connections? In Nehemiah, he is your mighty wall, protecting you from all of your enemies. In Esther, he delivers you from your enemies. And Job, he's the one who not only understands your struggles, but the one who has the power to do something about them in Psalms. He is your song and Jesus is your reason to sing. In Proverbs, he is your wisdom, helping you to make sense of this life and live it successfully. In Ecclesiastes, he is your purpose, helping you to keep from vanity. In Song of Solomon, he is your lover. And in Isaiah, he's the mighty counselor, prince of peace, everlasting father. Essentially, he's everything that you need. In Jeremiah, he's a king who will do right. In Lamentations, he's the faithful one who hears our cries. In Ezekiel, he's the one who assures that dead, dry bones will come alive again. In Daniel, he's the ancient of days, our God who never runs out of time. In Hosea, he's our faithful lover, always pleading with us to come back, come back. In Joel, he's your refuge who saves you in times of trouble. In Amos, he is the one upon whom you can depend. In Obadiah, he's the Lord of the kingdom. In Jonah, he is your salvation, bringing you back by his will. In Micah, he's judge. In Nahum, he's the jealous God. In Habakkuk, he is your rejoice in times of trouble. In Zephaniah, he's the witness. In Haggai, he overthrows the enemies. In Zechariah, he's the Lord of hosts. And in Malachi, he is the messenger of the covenant. And all that takes place before Jesus even comes onto the scene. And now he's here. And so in Matthew, he's the king of the Jews. And in Mark, he is the servant. In Luke, he's the son of man feeling what you feel. In John, he is the son of God who exclaims that it is finished. In Acts, he's the savior of the world. In Romans, he is the righteousness of God. In 1 Corinthians, he is your victory who allows us to say, oh death, where is your sting? In 2 Corinthians, he is the God of all comfort. In Galatians, he is your liberty. In, in Ephesians, he's the head of the church. In Philippians, he is your peace. In Colossians, he is your completeness. In First and Second Thessalonians, he is your hope and he is your glory. In First and Second Timothy, he is your faith and your stability. In Titus, he's both God and Savior. In Philemon, he's your benefactor. In Hebrews, Jesus is the author and perfecter of our faith. In James, he's the power behind your faith. In, in First Peter, he's the cornerstone. In Second Peter, he is your purity. In First, Second, and Third John. He's your life, your pattern, your motivation. In Jude, he's your foundation. And in Revelation, he is your coming king. Now somebody can say amen. Listen to me. Listen. Listen. I know him. <laughs> I know that man. I know him. I have the privilege to know him. I have the privilege to be led by him. Jesus follower, are you not proud to know this Jesus? This is your king. This is your savior. And if you don't know Jesus, if you don't know Jesus, I really want you to know him. We, we really want you to know him. Like, What's wild about this story is that Jesus, Jesus completes, Jesus fulfills all of this. It's extraordinary. The whole book points to him. But my favorite part is that for those of you who don't know him, he, he, he died for you. Like this Jesus, who's all powerful, who's big enough to fulfill all of this, he, he, he died for you. When he was on the cross, I think he had you in mind. I do, I just believe it. I think that's what scripture teaches. Jesus is on the cross. Jesus is on the cross and, and 
and he's been broken down and again, he fulfills all these prophecies in the old covenant. And before he takes his last breath, he cries, it is finished. Takes his last breath, he dies. And then the skies grow dark. Eyewitnesses record that the earth shakes. And do you remember that veil we talked about? You remember that? In the story, an eyewitness's account that, that this, this veil was torn in two. And what it signifies is that separation between God and man. The fact that, look, it was one day out of the year. It was one day out of the year where you could go in and you could see the glory of God. You had to be a high priest to go in, to crawl under this curtain, to see the glory of God. And Jesus says, it is finished, breathes his last. The skies grow dark, the earth shakes, and the veil is torn in two, signified. No, 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 you don't need special garments. You, you don't need to have all the right answers. You don't need to be a high priest. It doesn't need to be on one specific day out of the year. Anyone and everyone could step into the presence of God. The door is open. The question is, are you gonna step through it? Are, are, you, are you gonna step through it? I just wanna ask everyone to close their eyes. And I just wanna picture it. Look, Jesus did it for the whole world, but you're a part of the whole world. And I want you to think of the fact that Jesus died for you. He died for you. This King, this Lord, this Savior, this Creator died for you. And if you don't believe that, if you don't believe that, if you've never stepped over the line of faith and something clicked, the scripture says that the gospel, it's the power of God that brings salvation to all who believe. It opens blind eyes, it opens deaf ears. And so I just wanna give you an opportunity right now. Eyes are closed. If they aren't, close them. And I just want, I just wanna give you an opportunity if you've never believed, if you've believed that Jesus is your Lord and Savior, let today inspire you to actually live like it. But if you haven't, can I just plead with you? Believe, put your faith in Christ, put your hope in Jesus. And so I'm just gonna count to three. And on the count of three, if that's you, if you've never believed before and you're saying today is my day, today is the day of salvation, today is the day where I'm gonna move from death to life, I'm counting the cost, I'm gonna follow, Jesus, if that's you, I just want you to raise your hand on the count of three. One, two, three. If that's you, would you raise your hand? We see a bunch of hands. If you just raise your hand, would you, would you pray with me? Would you repeat this after me? And more important than this prayer, this prayer doesn't magically save you. Please come up to me after the service. Please come up to Pastor Herc after the service and we're gonna talk to you. We're gonna get some information. We're gonna kind of lead you on in this journey. We're, come up to the front. But if that's you, pray this with me. Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for what you've done. We thank you that you came and you fulfilled all that was said that you needed to fulfill. You lived a sinless life. You died a, you died a sinner's death, the death that I deserve to die, the death that we deserve to die, but you didn't stay dead a couple days later, you rose proving that you are who you say you are. And Father, we thank you for that. We surrender our life to you right now and by grace, through faith, we are stepping into a brand new life. If everyone could stand with me, if, if everyone could stand with me, can we give it up for those who took a step, who took a step of faith? Father, Father, we love you. You are so good, you are so gracious, you are so kind, you are so holy. And Father, for those of us who are believers in the room, we, we, we re-surrender our life to you in this moment because you're worthy of it. You're the king who didn't just die, but you rose from the dead and we believe it and we believe it again. And, if, and for those who raise their hand for the first time, God, I pray that this isn't just a mere academic experience where they feel, where they feel emotional, but I pray that you seal people with your spirit and people can step into a brand new life. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you that he's good. We thank you that he's holy and we praise his name in this moment. Come on, let's sing it out.
fuck it for the lamb he conquered death And the dead rose from their tombs And the angels stood in awe For the souls of all who come To the Father of the Son And the church of Christ was born Then the Spirit lit the flame And now this gospel truth Before Jesus ended his ministry on the earth, he speaks to a group of people just like us that had heard these things, that knew that Jesus was the fulfillment of all God had taught them before. And he tells a group of people that understood that, he says, he says you, know, you guys understand, don't you? All authority on heaven and earth has been given me. I've got all authority. He said, you've seen it, you've understood it from the prophets of old, and I fulfilled it. And he says, and because of that, I'm asking you, to go and make followers of all nations. Get them to understand who I am. They'll live a better life. They'll have more truth. They'll have more wisdom. They'll have more grace. They'll have more mercy in their life. They'll learn how to love more. They'll make this world a better place. They'll become the best person that they can be. Maybe not better than this person over here or better than that person over there, but the best person they can be. He says, go get them to, to, to follow me, to, to believe the story of what I've done. Now, that's many of you have made that decision. And when I speak to this to some people, they go, well, I just don't completely, totally believe the story yet. And I asked back, I said, what is it in life that you ever have 100% faith in that you do? When you go to ask somebody to get married, you're pretty sure you're gonna stay together, but it's not 100% sure. When you have children, you're, you're pretty sure they're gonna grow up to be children that you'd uh, be proud of, but you're not completely sure. So some of us have a, an acceptance factor on this first part of it. For me, I can make decisions real easy. So if I'm like on the 51% side, let's make the decision. Some of you others like need 90%, but you're never going to get 100. Some of you have enough information right now. Just by the message that Josh gave, you knew something inside of you saying, that's right. Trust in Jesus. I'd, I'd go with it. I'd go with it. That's God calling you to him. And he'll continue to do it. Maybe that's he's called you here to, this morning to, to make that step. Then the second step is he says, Jesus says, all authority has been given me. You go make followers. Tell them about me. He said, then next, baptize them. Have them make a public statement of faith that somehow God honors and does something through it. And it always follows belief. It always follows belief. And then he said, and lastly, after they believed and have trusted in Christ and the gates of heavens have been opened and my spirit resides in them and they've been baptized and made a public statement of faith, then he says, and go and learn all that I've commanded. In other words, go and, and continue to learn. And that's the journey we're on and that's why we have a church. We go and we continue to learn. I'm still awed every week hearing things about God and I know that many of you are. So where are you at on that journey? What do you need to do? What can the church do to help you with that? And with all that said, we're going to have a baptism service here in just a few weeks. First one at Oak Bridge City. I tell you what, it's a good time to step forward and to sign up out at the Information Center. 
And let's make that a celebration that all heaven rejoices in with us. God, we thank you. We thank you for the messenger today. But we thank you most for the, the one who is about. God, we thank you for the songs today. But we thank you most, not for the singers, but the one that they sang about. God, we love you and we love what you're doing through our hearts and we love that we could be a light collectively for Jesus Christ in this area. God, as we leave here today, help us to make a decision. If somebody needs to talk to your God, help him to come up and I'd love to share my story of faith with them about Jesus or hear theirs. God, guide us and touch us. Help us not come back the same next week. Help us to come closer to you. As we leave here today, God, we've got a sign on the back door that you're aware of that says it's all about your son, Jesus. May that be true in our lives. Father, we love you and we thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hey, real quick, we have next week, Josh is gonna be giving a live message here and then we start a Christmas series that, hold on, I forgot the name of it. And I gave the name of it. It's the unsettling solution for just about everything. So for three weeks, we're gonna have the unsettling solution for just about everything. And then we have Christmas Eve Eve service here at seven o'clock. That's whatever Christmas Eve Eve is, two days before Christmas Eve. And with all that said, we've got a great holiday season in front. Have a great Thanksgiving. Somebody around you, tell them have a great Thanksgiving. See you guys next week. Thanks for coming.